the other people from the Land Commission. Um, so let me just turn to David Adams. David, would you like to just introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is David Adams. I'm a Meritus Professor in Urban Studies at Glasgow University. Uh, my main interest as far as perhaps the nice discussion concerned in, in, in land are around housing, um, around land vacancy, dereliction, land reuse, uh, towns and town centres. Um, but I do happen to live in the borders near Melrose, which you can see from my background. So uh, I am perhaps the southernmost based uh, member of the board of the Land Commission. David, thank you. Um, and the other person from the Land Commission is Hamish Trench. Hamish, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello, yes. Hi, I'm Hamish Trench. I'm, uh, I'm Chief Executive of the Land Commission. Uh, I live uh, a bit further north in Grantham on Spey, uh, and I lead our staff team at the Commission. We've got a small staff team of about uh, 19 staff now, and uh, most of whom are based in Inverness, uh, some further south uh, in North Central Scotland as well. Hamish, thanks very much. And as I said, my name is Andrew Thin. I'm Chairman of the Land Commission. I also do one or two other things in my life. I chair a small charity. I work in the prison service and various other things as well, um, divide my time between Inverness, Stirling and Edinburgh, I think, really. Um, as it happens, I have a number of relatives farming in the borders, but that's a coincidence. Um, now, purpose, first of all, why, why are we doing this? Um, so every month we hold a public meeting somewhere in Scotland. Um, and until the pandemic, we held them in village halls and that kind of thing. And I, they were enormously valuable and actually and really very formative in the early period of, of shaping the Land Commission. Um, you clearly we're a wee organisation. Our job is to advise government and others on land and land reform. That's a huge subject, but there's only a, a, a limit to what we can do. So prioritising what we do has to be informed by the priorities of the Scottish people. And you can't find out what the priorities of the Scottish people are if you don't talk to them. So these, these meetings are hugely important and they continue to be because every three years we agree with the Scottish Government a, a, three, a plan for the next three years. And so we need to know what the priorities are going forward because we will, towards the end of this year, be working out our three-year proposals for the following three-year periods. So these meetings are important. For the time being, they're online, um, partly because of the pandemic, but partly actually because we found that online public meetings enable people, some people to engage who couldn't otherwise come to a public meeting. And, and that's really important. Of course, they don't enable the kind of offline private chats in the margins afterwards, which you get in the village hall. And I miss that actually. Um, but I'll come back to that because we'll, we, we you know, we still remain keen to have those private conversations as well. So that's what this is about. Um, the format, it's a, 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 one of us, and this evening it's going to be Hamish, will give you a, a short outline of what we're doing at the moment. Um, but what we're doing at the moment is not what we're going to be doing in two or three years time. I, I emphasize that, which is why we need to hear from you. And so the bulk of the meeting is a conversation with you in which you offer us, I hope, your thoughts about, so what are your priorities? What do you think we should be doing going forward? Um, and feel free to challenge us. We're public officials and, and we should be accountable to you. You are the Scottish people. So don't be afraid to, to challenge us if you wish. That's absolutely fine. Um, and indeed, in my view, an important part of these things. Um, it's, it's an important discipline on all public bodies. So please, please feel free to do that. Um, we'll, that conversation can will take place in two ways. There is on, on, these, on the Zoom thing a chat button, which you can probably see at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, it enables you to type things into the chat and everyone can see that. So you might want to offer your thoughts that way. Um, or, and, or, you might want to talk to us. In which case, if you go to the button that says raise hand and click that, a wee yellow hand will come up beside your name and I'll be able to invite you to contribute verbally. Um, so you, you can contribute either way. What I'll try and do, and it's some it's sometimes difficult, but what I'll try and do is keep track of what's happening in the chat and keep track of what's happening, of, of what people are saying. And I'll come back to David or to Hamish for, for 
reactions and reflections from time to time. We'll see how it goes. But it's not a QA, it's a conversation. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your ideas. Um, so please uh, see it in those terms. Um, we said we finished by 8.30, and I am a pedant, so we will finish by 8.30. Um, I, I promise you that. Uh, but uh, probably not before, but we'll see how things go. If, if you've had enough, it'll finish before. It's up to you. So I think that's probably enough from me. I should probably also say it's being recorded, though I think it says that somewhere on your screen. But just so if you've done something down and way, if you're being recorded, uh, so just remember that. Um, and the recording will in due course be available, so you can you can have another look if you want. I think that's enough, Hamish. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to you. Hamish is going to just run us through a wee presentation to to set the scene and you know get us all onto the same playing field because some people in this audience will know far more about us than others. So over to you, Hamish. Hi, thank you. I'm going to start just with uh, just thinking about what land reform is all about. What what is land reform? And so I'm pausing just while I, there we go, just while I try and get these slides working. There we go. Just if we have a think about what is land reform all about, first of all, and, and some of you will be aware that Scottish Government have a consultation out at the moment on a, a land reform bill coming up. Um, and of course, we could spend all evening on that, I'm sure. Um, but land reform is much wider, actually. Um, legislative change is hugely important and integral part of it. Um, but I think land reform is also significantly about culture change. And no doubt we'll talk about both aspects tonight. I think, as you'd expect, land reform clearly is about the pattern of land ownership, who owns what and, and where. Um, we're quite familiar with land reform being about tenure, land tenure, tenant farming in particular, agricultural tenure and wider land tenure options. Land reform is very much about current topics, uh, carbon sequestration, natural capital, the kind of changes that we see uh, in landscapes around us at the moment. Um, but of course, it's not all rural either. Um, it's, it's vacant and derelict land. It's the, the derelict sites in the heart of communities right across Scotland. Uh, and we'll come on and talk a bit more about those as well. It's about land use planning. You know, it's about the decisions um, in terms of how land is used as well as how land is owned. Um, and of course, it's about uh, community ownership and control of both of land itself and of decision making uh, about land. Um, and, you know, absolutely fantastic example recently in terms of community expanding ownership and control in the south of Scotland with the Langham Initiative, um, having already secured the first phase of ownership, obviously really good news recently, um, securing that second phase uh, as a result of a really positive um, process with the Clue Estate. Uh, and and, and you know, community ownership we can see expanding right across um, Scotland uh, at the moment. So land reform is about all of these things, and, and ultimately, I think, uh, certainly for us at the Land Commission, we see it as being a fundamental part of efforts to ensure that communities right across Scotland um, are successful, are places that people want to and can live and work in. Um, it, it's absolutely central to some of the big public challenges that Scotland faces uh, in terms of economic opportunity, housing provision, uh, communities responding to climate change uh, and the biodiversity crisis. So, I mean, that's why we at the Land Commission are quite excited about what we do um, and about the work and the role that we have. Um, the Commission itself was established five years ago now, just over five years ago in 2017, um, by the Scottish Parliament in the last Land Reform Act. And our role basically is to stimulate fresh thinking uh, about how we own and use land in Scotland uh, and to advise the Scottish Government, uh, particularly in relation to legislative and policy change. Um, but also to work with everyone in terms of good practice uh, and, the, and the culture change and, and how we can help good things happen on the ground in relation to, to a fair and, and productive approach to the way we own and use land in Scotland. We, we are a national organisation um, and set up with, uh, with, six land, with, with six commissioners, five land commissioners and the tenant farming commissioner. Um, and I'll say a wee bit more about, about tenant farming uh, later on as well. One of the core reference points for us is the, uh, the land rights responsibility statement that the Scottish Government and, and indeed the Scottish Parliament uh, endorsed and published um, a few years ago. Um, and this again came out of the last Land Reform Act, and it's a, a core statement about the relationship that um, the Scottish Parliament wants to see between people and the land in Scotland. And it sets out six principles, uh, and for those of you interested, it well, well worth a look at the, the kind of framing that that provides um, for taking land reform forward uh, in Scotland. At the moment, actually, Scottish Government have just been reviewing that, and so no doubt we'll hear more shortly over the next couple of months uh, about a, a revised, updated version uh, of this core reference point coming out. But then what I want to just talk a wee bit about tonight is the, the broad areas of work that we as the Land Commission are engaged in at the moment. 
Um, and in our current kind of plan, these form into these three broad areas, reforming land rights, very much about how land is owned, uh, responsible land ownership and use, uh, how the decisions are, are about land ownership and use uh, are made and, and, and so on. Uh, and then the third theme around reforming land markets, um, again, fundamental to the way that land markets, urban and rural, uh, operate across Scotland. So briefly look first at some of the key aspects of work around reforming land rights and, and ownership and governance in particular. Um, you know, a, a core aspect to this and a core aspect being driven by Scottish government, of course, is to encourage a more diverse pattern of land ownership and diverse in all sorts of ways uh, across private, public, NGO, uh, community uh, sectors uh, and increasingly perhaps uh, opportunities to, to share and, uh, and, and blend and mix some of those sectors particularly supporting new governance models, uh, looking at not just ownership, but control and benefit from land, um, and addressing the, the underlying human rights relationship that, uh, that is central to Scottish land reform uh, and built into the, the previous Land Reform Act. One of the earliest pieces of work uh, we looked at was particularly around concentration, scale and concentration of land ownership in Scotland, uh, which was one of the first areas that the government asked the Commission to look at. Um, we, we did extensive work and research looking at international practice, but also lived experience in Scotland in relation to the effects of scale and concentration um, in land ownership um, and, and made recommendations which are now taking, being taken forward in the consultation on the land reform bill uh, in relation to some of the measures that uh, could modernise the, the regulation uh, of, of land ownership uh, in Scotland. And very closely related, obviously, to ownership is the way land markets um, function. Um, and, and quite a lot of our focus, in fact, a pleasing amount of our focus at the moment is on looking at the way uh, land markets function, particularly in rural Scotland. Uh, there's, there's no question we're seeing significant changes, and I'm sure in the borders you'll be very aware of significant changes operating in the land market. Uh, you know, you'll be well aware land values themselves have risen significantly over the last couple of years. Uh, we published research in April um, showing that this rise in land value is partly due to interest in what's called natural capital and carbon sequestration in particular, um, but also due to ongoing strong demand for woodland planting, uh, again responding to the climate crisis and the government policies to expand woodland uh, right across uh, Scotland. So no question that, uh, that the motivations for land ownership and land value associated with that are changing as a result of these drivers uh, in, in addressing climate. Uh, fundamentally, what, what our work on this shows actually is that the, the amount of land coming to the market is, has remained quite low, um, but demand for land is increasing uh, dramatically, um, including from these, as a result of these new drivers. So big questions that we're working on in terms of what is a fair approach to this, how do we harness this productively for Scotland? Uh, we've published uh, recommendations to realise some of the opportunities here um, and address, help address some of the risks um, that this inevitably arises uh, for Scotland. Uh, and, and while part of this could be legislative, there's also a huge amount that could be done in practice um, at the moment um, to put in place responsible approaches um, to managing this. But as I said at the start, our work is not just about rural Scotland. Uh, we've also had a major focus over the years on vacant and derelict land. Uh, we convened the National Task Force bringing together public, private uh, and community sectors to really lead a change in culture about how we bring vacant and derelict sites back into productive use uh, in communities right across Scotland. Uh, that's led to increased funding through the Scottish Government, but also changes in culture and approach. Uh, and there's a huge amount of activity actually being taken forward, led by local authorities and others, uh, bringing long-standing derelict sites back into productive use uh, in Scotland. And again, that's something that, uh, that we see in communities right across um, Scotland, north and south, uh, not just in urban centres, but, uh, but uh, more rural towns as well. Um, as we touched on at the start more widely uh, in that sort of development area, um, we've looked particularly at housing land. Uh, we've reviewed the way Scotland's housing land supply comes forward, uh, how we actually allocate and, and bring forward land uh, for housing, uh, and made recommendations for significant reforms in the way that the housing land market works. Um, our work, I think, has shown that the, the speculative model of house building that dominates UK and Scotland um, doesn't really deliver that well, particularly for rural Scotland or indeed for urban regeneration um, areas uh, in city centres. Uh, and we've proposed a much more active and direct role for public bodies in assembling land and bringing it forward for development uh, and making sure that it's in ownership that will actually bring forward and, and deliver uh, on development. And, and a final area that I'll flag uh, in terms of current and recent work um, no question that uh, tax is obviously a very significant influence uh, on land ownership and land use and decisions about land. Uh, we've looked at international experience of, of land value taxes, for example, 
um, and in January this year, having been asked by government to look at reforms to support land reform objectives, uh, we published advice on tax, uh, which included recommendations on how land values could be taxed more effectively in future, um, and some specific reforms to help uh, help it help deliver on the government's land and economic um, policy. Uh, and no question that over the long term, uh, tax is a very significant influence uh, on on land use and land ownership decisions. But moving on to the, that final um, third uh, theme of accountability and responsibility, um, as well as providing policy advice, actually a significant amount of our time, a huge part of the team's time actually is focused on uh, helping people do things well on the ground. Um, we have a good practice program uh, that works directly with landowners, land managers and communities right across Scotland, uh, helping put the land rights responsibilities into practice, uh, helping understand uh, ourselves and uh, helping others understand what those really look like on the ground in different circumstances, uh, working with the farming community, the land owning community, uh, nature conservation organisations, uh, local communities, uh, all, all in terms of actually how do we make the, the land rights responsibilities a reality uh, for people on the ground. Uh, to help this, we, we've published a suite of nine protocols which set out some practical expectations. Um, and around that, we have a whole series of casework uh, people are able to contact us for one-to-one -one, um, casework and advice, for example, in particular situations, uh, and we provide wider guidance and advice uh, on how people can, can bring these principles to life uh, and implement them on the ground. And then the final area I want to touch on is, is just to flag the work of the Tenant Farming Commissioner, um, who, as part of the Board of the Land Commission, has particular functions set out in the legislation. Um, his role really is all about improving relations between agricultural landlords um, and tenants. And again, he works by you know, providing codes of practice, providing clarity of expectations about responsible practice and sorts of behaviour in those landlord tenant relationships, uh, with casework again working directly with individuals uh, in supporting cases, supporting them through disputes and resolutions. Uh, we provide support for mediation services, for example, um, and also quite a bit of work looking at uh, new entrants and future succession, uh, including supporting the, the land matching service and uh, matching new entrants with land availability. Um, so again, a huge, huge amount of work going on actually in terms of uh, improving, not just improving the relations, but improving the effectiveness of the tenant farming um, sector as a whole. So that's a very quick run through some key areas of work. Just a couple of uh, resources I'll flag before I finish and hand back to Andrew. Um, a couple of resources if you're looking for more information, obviously apart from our own website, and you'll see links coming up to that in the chat as we go through um, the discussion this evening. Um, the, the My Land website is an online hub, and particularly if you're looking for stories about how people, how communities are engaging with land uh, and making a difference uh, in land in their own particular communities. Uh, and our podcast, I will also um, give a, a plug for unashamedly, um, if you're looking for insight and interesting stories, um, and again, about how people are engaging, making use of land in imaginative ways right across Scotland, uh, do tune into our podcast through our website. Uh, as a final plug, I will do for the Land Reform Bill consultation. Um, I mentioned at the start, Scottish Government um, are consulting on a, a new land reform bill at the moment. Um, please do make sure if you have a, a strong interest in this and have views, please do make sure that you're, you're, uh, you have your say and, and have a look at this consultation on the Scottish Government pages. Uh, the homepage on the, on the government site looks like this. You'll find it very easily on the Scottish Government consultation hub. Uh, and no doubt we may come on to talk more about uh, what might be in some of that and, and the direction of that um, through the evening. So that's a very quick overview, but as Andrew said, um, really um, tonight is, is about hearing from you, so I'll pass back, Andrew, to you just now. Thanks, Hamish, very helpful. And um, Alison's already put her hand up. That's brilliant, Alison, thank you. Can I just, a few words before um, we, we launch into the discussion. Um, first of all, you'll see already that there's a whole, that links are popping up on the, the chat function, and behind the scenes is Posey McRae, who's doing a brilliant job make, trying to make sure that these links do go up. She'll continue to try and do that in response to whatever you want to offer by way of thought. So thank you, Posey, for that. Um, we are a pretty small organization. Um, our job is to focus on providing advice about land reform, land issues. So I appreciate you'll want to talk about all sorts of thing, things. Um, some things you'll want to talk about, are, are, are may, we may well not have a remit in, but we'll try and deal with anything you want to talk about. Talk about your priorities, your hopes, your fears, your aspirations, your proposals, what should we be working on? Um, and now, can I, yeah, I can see hands, so that's great. I, I saw in the chat, um, but I'm sorry, I don't know if this is Mrs. or Ms. or Mr., but somebody, PJ Lewis, asking about 
I didn't quite understand the point about human rights being governed by law, but maybe whoever that is. Oh, great. PJ Lewis has got a hand up, but I can't see a picture. So we'll get we'll get the real story. But let's start with Alison. She was first. So over to you, Alison. Uh, one of my major concerns is the huge expansion of Christmas tree forests all over the borders countryside. I have aesthetic objections. They take away the contours of the hills, the colours of the hills, they destroy wildlife habitat. But my main concern is that because big corporations and big landowners are getting grants from the carbon offset grant money, it means they're coming in, planting up huge commercial forests, and it's basically a great big tax scam. It means that farmers are not able to buy the land because land prices are going up horrendously. I was in the Lake District at the weekend talking to a farmer whose brother works in Dumf has a farm in Dumfries and Galloway. He was considering relocating. He talked to Galbraith, the, uh, the land agents, who said, don't even try, mate. You cannot get in. There are so many big corporations. So my problem is that we are now having absentee landlord, landowners who aren't living in this country, who are big corporations making huge amounts of money. Secondly, this will affect the Scottish land fund ability, land fund ability to help community buyouts. Because if the land keeps increasing in value, how are communities going to afford, even with grants from the Scottish government, to buy land? I mean, look what happened with the Duke of Buclou. They've got the land now, but look how much it's cost. Look how much crowdfunding they had to do. He sat there raking in the money. They're all sat there raking in the money. It is a great big scam, and I'm absolutely furious about it. The Scottish government's own policies are making the situation around land reform in Scotland worse. We're going to get to the situation where tenant farmers are going to be put off their land. It'll be like a second round of clearances. That's me. Awesome. Thanks very much indeed. And I, I will pick up. There's a number of issues in there, fundamental of which is a sense of, of uh, a lack of, of <laughs> disenfranchisement, maybe it's sort of too strong. I don't know whether that's really right, Alison, you can nod or not. <laughs> um, but uh, um, so, uh, a view that we, we often hear, it is about power as much as anything else, and I'm going to come to that. But I'd like to hear some other thoughts rather than bounce backwards and forwards between um, you and David and Hamish. So whoever the P and J Lewis is, and forgive me, I don't know your gender or anything else, but over to you. Um, thanks, Andrew. I, I think I'm I've got <laughs> That's my preferred pronoun, certainly, he. Um, the, the point I was really directing to Hamish is that uh, there never seems to be a very clear articulation of the problems. And my reference to human rights is actually human rights problems are identified and then law is changed in order to address it. And then it's enshrined in law. Um, so to pick up on Alison Curry's comment about the inflation of land prices forcing farmers out, actually, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic. I, I see that directly as a farmer, but, you know, being approached to sell land rather than um, for forestry, which I don't want to do. So a skewed market is fair enough. And uh, Hamish's comment about uh, monopoly uh, may be a very valid point uh, that, you know, in which case there are monopoly rules and they perhaps should be extended. But the general point I wanted to make is until we have a very clear and, and factual understanding of what the problems and effects are, like the one that Alison referred to, you can't begin to fix it. And, and so I would really love it um, if the SLC would start a piece of work that actually quantified in material terms what the problems are in order to inform and provide the baseline for reform. Thanks. Can I, can I, so we heard from Alison a sort of articulation, pretty clear articulation of how, of problems that bother her. Do, uh, do, uh, do I take it from what you said that, I mean, you presumably have views about what those problems are. I mean, do you want to offer some, us some thoughts about what you think the problems are? 
Yeah, I, I, okay. I, I mean, I think that the, uh, I don't agree with, with some of what Alison said, but the fact is that I think the carbon markets are having a detrimental effect on the agricultural uh, market. Uh, and, you know, that, that, uh, principally in terms of land cost. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate issue to uh, to consider. Um, she alluded to farmers moving, but actually I see it more directly in terms of new entrants, which I think are, you know most people would accept are essential uh, if we are to have an agricultural industry. Um, perhaps uh, the, the 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 tax advantages uh, do skew certain. Um, uh, values, which, would, you know, if they were changed, would lead to a reduction. But the point is, you start by saying the agricultural market is, is skewed uh, by certain influences, uh, and we need to fix that. And that's an articulation of a problem. You state clearly, you know, with fact, for example, not a few farmers, but hypothetically, 110 new entrants tried to find land last year, and, and I know that your matching service will have these figures, tried to find land and got no responses to their applications. You know, that's, that's evidential. And what I'm really getting at here is let's make this evidential and factual. And in so doing, we'll actually bottom out what the real issues are. Is it that they can't find land? Is it that they're actually not capitalized sufficiently in order to take up the opportunities that are there, which I you know, have seen personally in one case. Um, I could go on, but I, I hope that I'm making the, the point that yes. what we need is a factual baseline of, of what the problems are in order to use that as our departure for, for fixing it. Not, not the conceptual, and I, and, and I will pick up on Hamish's statement. Well, actually, I think it was the Scottish government statement, but you quoted it as appears to be causing problems. That, that really, I think, is inadequate for such radical for reform. Great, thank you very much. I, I think given you've got a university professor uh, from in the Land Commission and Hamish, who is also an academic originally in some ways, Hamish is frowning at me, but... Um, <laughs> He certainly has an academic background. I think that your point about we must be evidence-led, evidence-driven is a very well-made point, and I will come to both of them. But I want to hear from others first. And the next person with the hand up says, A. Packard, I happen to know, or I'm guessing, Anne, it's Anne Packard. Is that right? I'm sorry. Um, I just, in a way, want to um, ag agree in part with some of what Alison said. The RSA, in conjunction with SOCI, I hosted a, a various Zoom meetings um, about the Regional Land Use Partnership. And the one thing, or there were various things that came up consistently, the one I think which concerned people most was this issue of corporate purchase for offsetting and the future damage it could do, not necessarily will do, but could do to communities um, and the uncertainty that it brings. Um, there was reference also to the issue of around new entrants, but also whether any pattern of changing ownership because of carbon offsetting would have unfortunate consequences in some of the smaller communities with a changing demography as it aged, because there may be less incentive for younger people to stay there and live and work there. And I think um, we just need to be aware that not all is lost and sold before it's too late. And thanks very much. Um, I'm going to keep going with people who are wanting to speak. I will come back to David and Hamish. There's quite a list developing Hamish and David. Uh, but Barbara is next with her hand up. Barbara, over to you. Hi, um, thanks um, for um, asking me to comment. Um, I would like to go back to some of the comments that Alison made. 
I represent the community of Newcastleton, and we are also a beneficiary of the community land buyout um, that Langham have um, benefited from. And you made a statement which I think was a bit grossly unfair, Alison, about the clue. The clue haven't raked it in at all. They set a land price per acre well before the carbon offset and the, and the price rises came into being and they've honoured that. They could have taken significantly more capital. Langham chose to buy a very large pocket of land and had to raise the capital accordingly. So just to get the facts straight, <coughs> the clue did not break it in as they could have done. Um, that aside, <coughs> I agree with some of the issues you've made, the points you made about forestry, and I'm particularly concerned about the lack of responsibility and accountability on communities like ours. <coughs> we are severely impacted by flood and climate change. And sitting at the bottom of a valley on a floodplain um, means we are extremely vulnerable. And what happens upstream and who manages what happens upstream is beyond our king. We bought land to be able to move off the floodplain, expand our community beyond the risk. And we hope to be able to do that in time. But what we cannot do and what we need to manage is to incorporate the challenges that that climate change is having on, on, on that take up of land. So the agricultural use, which is, to be frank, um, less of a challenge for us to manage than forestation, because the runoff for forestation, the impact on the land for forestation and no policy managing that in terms of policing what happens on the land, and they plant and extract is where we end up. We end up with poorly managed land as a result of forestation. And something needs to happen between the opportunity and the reason for carbon sequestration and all the rest of it and the benefits to community benefit and to land um, protection, if you like, because we're the ones who end up suffering at the end of the day. We have long campaigned as a community, a bit like, community benefit funds for wind farms, that if, if forestation owners were charged a penny a tree and it was paid back to the communities that surround those, those areas, then there would be a real benefit potentially and, and they would have to raise their game. And, and, and I would strongly urge you to consider looking at some form of model that allows us to police, fund the policing of forestation and to manage that and to put that levy on the people who are benefiting from the tax gain of investing in forestation. Barbara, thanks. Um, and we are going to do some work on community benefits. So I'm going to ask him to talk about that in a second. Um, Thank you. No more hands up at the moment. So I'm going to come to Hamish and David. Alison, would you mind very much muting your speaker? Because I think I might oh, be Sorry. Here. It's all right, no, it's fine. Um, it's fine, absolutely fine. Um, Hamish first and then David. So let, let's first of all, we'll come to the issue of that being evidence led, which is a heart, an issue very close to both of your heart. But I wonder if we could start, please, by just some thoughts on what you've heard. There's a, there's a theme in there, which is about engaging people in land use decision making, uh, land use planning, particularly at a period of change, um, carbon offset, driving up prices and all the rest of it. And the community benefits part of that whole picture. So, Hamish, some thoughts about what we're doing and what we might do that might help that people might might be helpful, and then people can react to that and say, "Well, that's nonsense. You should be doing this or, or whatever." Yeah, and you're really really interesting to hear um, the um, the folks' views around the, the change, the changing land use and landscape at the moment, particularly driven by natural capital. Um, so, yeah, I think. There, are, there is a huge opportunity for Scotland here, obviously, in terms of getting enough finance in to deliver the kind of land use that Scotland needs to, to improve its nature and, and address climate change. But I think we're all seeing, and, and what you're seeing, are some of the big risks that go alongside that. Um, and, and that's where our advice has been focused on. How do we both kind of realise the good to the upside of this, but how do we manage those risks? And a lot of that is about proper decision making and engagement uh, and joined up decision making uh, across the landscape scale. So I think, I mean, very, very clearly, there is already a clear expectation for communities, local communities, to be engaged in decisions about land. And, and that's actually been one of the successful changes over the last five years or so uh, of land reform in Scotland. 
uh, we have seen uh, a great deal of you know, increase in, in community engagement uh, in land use decisions. But I think that's, that's still very challenging with the pace and scale and type of change that we're seeing um, at the moment, um, and, and some of which you're describing. Um, so, 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 I mean, the, the advice that we've given to government and the recommendations we made suggest that there are, there are some legislative approaches to this, um, particularly around the point of transfer of land ownership, uh, and we've proposed a form of public interest test, and then that's actually one of the proposals in the consultation for the, the bill at the moment. But we also think there's a huge amount of this which is about governance uh, and actually channeling some of the finance that is coming into land to, to help um, deliver a community benefit uh, and actually help deliver a community ownership and get behind that as well. Um, and, and the third element, as we've touched on, is clearly the policy and, and tax, you know, how the how the land management support um, policy, uh, finance uh, and tax regime um, supports and, and manages these, these changes as well. So I think the, the final bit I'll, I'll mention, Andrew, is, is yeah, on, on the community benefit. Um, there is there is, I think, now a really clear expectation from the government down that um, that this kind of change, uh, and particularly the, the woodland and, and carbon and peatland change, should deliver benefits for local communities. Uh, and we're doing some work at the moment on what that might look like, the different models. Uh, one option, obviously, is learning from renewables uh, and the kind of wind farm fund, community benefit fund approach that has, has become commonplace there. Uh, we're looking at if and how that could be applied in a wider uh, natural capital context. Um, but we're also working with a number of communities, land managers uh, and others across Scotland at the moment to look at different ways of delivering community benefit through woodland, peatland and other natural capital investment. So we'll certainly be providing more examples and more advice of what works, what doesn't work, uh, and equally how government could also develop policy to, to support that uh, more effectively as well. It was just before I turn to David, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more. So obviously, anything that requires legislation takes a long time. Um, and, and, and some of these changes are happening very fast and we need a fast response. And I think that was Alison's, part of what Alison was getting at. That, that forgive me, Alison, I'm paraphrasing you, but my sense, my sense from what Alison said was a slight sense of frustration that this is ha all happening really fast and we're behind the curve. Could you say a wee bit more about the, the, the sort of protocols and codes and that kind of approach, which is much faster? Yeah, so, so just this month, actually, we published a new protocol, uh, a protocol on responsible practice in natural capital. And, and that sets out these expectations that communities should be engaged right up front in planning these investments and land use change. Uh, and not only that, that communities should benefit. Um, and if there is significant finance to be made uh, from them, that communities should share in that financial benefit uh, as well as wider uh, benefits. Um, and it also addresses expectations around joining up land use decisions. Uh, you know, that, that land shouldn't be managed for carbon in a silo, um, but should be managed to, to deliver carbon alongside nature and, and other economic and social benefits as well. So the protocol is there to, to set those expectations, to provide clarity on that. And again, like others, we'll work with individuals and, and support individual cases to provide advice on how that can be done. It provides a mechanism for people to feed back to us on examples of either particularly poor practice or indeed particularly good practice uh, that, will, uh, that will help um, share, uh, share that experience as well. Um, so I think uh, I mean that, that is an important point. And, and the other part of this, which is moving very rapidly, is the way that government might uh, regulate the carbon markets directly. You know, part of what we're dealing with, we, we can do some of this through the land market and through responsible land management. Uh, some of it has to be done through through the kind of regulation and framework for carbon trading and, and the carbon markets as well. Thanks, David. D David, I'm going to come to you now. Um, I've got two hands up, so I'll be going back to, to our guests in a minute. But David, th th thought, I mean, further thoughts on what Hamish has been talking about, of course, but I think it'd be really helpful as a um, you know, a university, you know, a very respected university professor, just on the issue of, of being evidence led, it is hugely important. And, and um, Peter Lewis is, is making a really important point there. Uh, so it'd be good to respond to that in particular, but but also in anything else you've heard. David. Yeah, th <clears throat> uh, thanks indeed, Andrew. Um, I th that, that it's a really interesting point, and I think we just need to understand um, really the, the kind of evidence that we deal with. So the issues we're talking about in land reform are, are very much about the relationship of people in Scotland and, and, and land and, and the areas within which they live. Now, what we need to do if we're going to get to the bottom of that is to have a fairly broad view of what constitutes evidence. So I'm going to start just with vacant and derelict land, um, but then I'm going to move on to talk about land ownership. So 
Um, there, there are different sorts of evidence. Uh, we, we have statistics on the number of vacant derelict sites, and we can undertake, we have undertaken some sort of very advanced statistical analysis. But we need to be very careful of not thinking that statistics tell us everything. But just as important are people's stories. So as well as sort of the, what, what you would call the basic facts and figures, we've done quite a bit of work on how people feel living in Inner Glasgow next to that site that has been vacant for 25 years and how it has affected their mental health. And their feelings and their individual stories, to me, are just as important evidence as the basic facts and figures. In other words, we need to think about what one might call qualitative evidence as well as quantitative evidence. So if we move on and think about patterns of land ownership in Scotland, we do have figures of the proportion of land uh, that's owned by a very small number of, of, of people in Scotland and, and, and how statistically land ownership is very skewed and very unevenly distributed. But again, that doesn't tell the story. So if you go to our original report on scale and concentration, there's some very interesting stories in there. And I'm just going to quote one story, which is about a public meeting in a village to discuss a particularly controversial planning application put forward by the landowner. So everyone in the village gathers. And then shortly before the event occurs, uh, the factor comes into the hall. And the perceptions, whether the perceptions are right or wrong, the perceptions reported to us was the people felt that the factor's demeanor and the factor's approach and how he sat and how he turned around and looked at people affected what they were prepared to say. Now, you may think that that is not evidence. It's certainly not statistical evidence. But actually, when you take stories and when you take a whole number of stories and put them together and you get a pattern, you're actually acting the same way, should we say, as a detective is, looking to solve the crime. So I think... In terms of evidence, we just need to be careful of those who might want to restrict us simply to statistical evidence. And we need to be open to people's stories and put those stories together to get, should we say, a richer picture of what's going on. So the Land Commission has certainly done a lot of statistical work, and we're proud of that, but we've also done a lot of, should we say, more qualitative work that's actually told us what's behind those facts and figures. Thanks, Andrew. David, thank you. Now, um, uh, so there's just one or two things in the in the chat. So I'm just going to mention them, but I'll we'll, we'll come back to them. W one is about the the, the bill consult, the Gulf Scottish Government's bill consultation. I'm not sure that we can deal with that. It's not our consultation. So, I I, I mean, I'm, I, we can have a discussion if you write it, if you wish, of course. But I, I don't think we know what the answer. I, I mean, I think. If I understand what's being asked in the chat, it's, up, it's being asked, what's the government proposing? And I suspect that the government is asking you what it should do, and that's the point of a consultation, but it's, it's not ours, so I'm sorry, I can't help with that one. But there's another one in there about engaging with young people, and I will come back to that. It's an important issue for us already. Um, we are doing some things. It'd be interesting to know what else you think we should be doing. Now, there's three hands up. Two of you have already spoken, so forgive me. I'm going to go to Helen because I want to allow people who have not yet spoken the chance to speak first. If um, there's no one with a hand up who's not who, who's not spoken, then, of course, I'll come to Alison and Mr Lewis. But Helen, over to you. Uh, yes, I'm Helen Ferguson, um, and I'm from the Scottish border, stayed fairly locally um, on, in eastern Berwickshire. And... I just have one or two concerns really regarding, you know, the whole land reform process. In terms of engagement, um, engagement with people who whose lives will be affected by this change, who may not find this level or this type of engagement easy. You referred earlier on to the factor who came into the room and, and made everybody potentially feel awkward and, and looks at everything else. It's the same for people who work on the land. Their knowledge is an intrinsic knowledge. It's quite often a generation, generational knowledge. And the fear from them is they're going to be losing their jobs in a lot of 
different aspects. The people who work in the hills, whether it be the gatekeepers, the stalkers, the gillies or whatever. And for them to engage meaningfully, um, to come into an environment like this is very, very difficult for them, partly because they're working at this time for the night as well. So the whole process of engagement, you know, has to encompass everybody. That's one aspect of my concerns, my, you know, not only the potential of people losing jobs and the traditional skills and the traditional local knowledge of a local area, but also the impact in terms of biodiversity. You know, there doesn't seem to be a holistic approach taken to biodiversity in Scotland. It's, it's all becoming very sort of, um, I don't know, there's just, there's just not an overall approach. You know, we're getting, as, as other people have mentioned, I think as in particular, all these sort of, um, you know, a lot of afforestation um, and there's money obviously involved in, in Sitka spruce, but that's not necessarily beneficial to to any of the, the biodiversity um, aims and objectives that are present at the moment. Our upland raiders are really struggling at the moment. We have uh, obligations to try and conserve the curlew. The curlew doesn't live in trees. The curlew needs, um, you know, moorland and protection and such like. And really, we're looking at mass um, extinction if we're not careful. Moorland, peatland, grassland all sequester carbon. But that's ignored in favour of tree planting and regeneration and rewilding with the potential of the loss of significant jobs and significant local knowledge. And I think that is something that's fundamental to Scotland. And I think we're, we're selling ourselves short if we do not appreciate the local knowledge that exists in rural areas. Thank you. And thanks, so that's really helpful. Um, can I just, um, so, I mean, we I couldn't agree more about the issue of engaging people and we, you know, for a tiny wee public body, we've spent a disproportionate amount of money on trying to do that. You know, we've got 14 staff and we're probably the only public body that holds a public meeting every month in Scotland. Well, just give us give us a flavour of what you think sh could be done to better engage. I mean, I'm absolutely with you now. I meet with the SGA quite often, so I'm with you on keepers. Um, we, you know, we meet with NFUS, we meet with the Tenant Farmers Association. What, what what other things could be done to better engage those particular kinds of audiences? What are your thoughts? Helen, I was wondering if you wanted to offer any thoughts on that, no. Sorry, sorry. yes, I hadn't realized I'm muted. Um, yeah, I, I think it's important really to engage people on their own level and in their own environment. And then you get a better and enriched um, understanding of, of, of the knowledge that people have. You know, this sort of environment, you know, we're all talking about communities. We, we talk about the conservation organisations. Their interest is different from people who work the ground, probably. And therefore, you know, to come into this environment, you know, it's perhaps actually online is not so bad. But, you know, if you're living up a remote glen, you're... Um, um, phone signal might not be working, you know, the weather is affected and all these sorts of things. You, you're you're assuming that everybody's got the same access to broadband and everything else. And at this time of the year, you know, everybody who's working out the land is probably really, really busy, you know, and there seems to be a lack of awareness of the, the sort of natural cycle and the natural processes that go on in the, in the rural environment. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, from my knowledge of the Commission staff, I think that's unfair. I think they actually do have a pretty good knowledge, but but you're describing a problem, which is that there are particular groups of people that are very difficult to engage because they're they're busy, they don't like going to online meetings and so on. And I guess what I would what I'm hoping for is that you can help us and offer us some answers as well as problems on that front. But I'll I'll leave that just now because there's others wanting in. But um, please, please, could 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 you help us with with this sort of thing? I don't think we're disagreeing with you. Um, Chris Fairgrief, you you've got your hand up and you're next. So I'm passing to you. Yeah, hi there. Good evening and thanks. Um, I'm a long-standing ecologist, uh, working mainly freelance, but also previously with the Scottish Wildlife Trust in the Scottish Borders. 
And I'd just like to ask if the panel and indeed some of the other guests, um, and this echoes some of the sentiments that were just conveyed by Helen Ferguson there about uh, biodiversity and livelihoods. But I just wonder if the panel and some of the guests could speak to some of the opportunities and the potential to influence existing ownership uh, to be more considered in terms of the approach towards biodiversity, conservation and management. Not necessarily uh, mandating ownership change, um, but a sense of accountability regarding natural capital and encouragement to help meet very essential biodiversity and ecological targets and how to realise some wider benefits, if you like, and translate that into livelihood uh, benefits as well in the local communities. Um, I forgive my ignorance on most of these matters. Um, I do know a little bit about some of the context and I was lucky enough to work recently down at Langham on the Moor and that's a fantastic example. But again, just if there are thoughts and ideas on scope out with rigid land ownership sale or acquisition, but how to work with existing owners. Do you want to offer any thoughts, Chris, before I move on? Do you want to offer any thoughts that, I mean, you must have thought about this or you wouldn't have asked? Um, I have, yeah. I mean, I, there's obviously no kind of silver bullet or, 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 or magic solutions, but I think there might be ways to look at involving agencies that are already working in conservation a bit more with those who, like Helen said, are at the grassroots level of land management and, and uh, living off the land, if you like. Um, as well as that, obviously, there could be influence exerted via policy change and incentivization for uh, ideas or, 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 or uh, proposals to incorporate biodiversity conservation enhancement into land management generally um, and ultimately you know I'm, I'm not a radical in that sense I'm much more in favour of a gradualist approach but if it came to that it may be that legislation was required to actually uh, stronger in stronger terms encourage that type of land management. Chris thanks very much indeed uh, very helpful. Um, Alistair McKinnon, um, you're next, I think. Hi, everybody, and good evening. Thanks very much for listening, and, and thanks for letting me ask the question. Mine is, for, it's just a very general question in, in terms of uh, the Scottish Government. And the, my question is, in terms of uh, trusteeship, does the Scottish Government hold the, the public lands in trust for the Scottish people? I'm not sure we can ask that. We're not the Scottish Government and we don't speak for the Scottish Government. So I, I, mean, I mean, I can give you a, a sort of general thought, but it's probably no accurate, no more accurate than yours. What do you think? You're muted, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I understand they have had a discussion with Derek Mackay quite a number of years ago now on acquiring land for a community project. And um, this was actually at the Scottish Government, and I think it was called Bring Your Dangerous Ideas Day to Parliament. And that was quite a number of years ago. And I don't think I'll ever do that again, but um, <laughs> um, my question, the question, the questions from the audience kept coming back to land and being able to, as community organisations, being able to access the land. And uh, when I, I, when I was a chat with them, I said, what does the Scottish Government hold in terms of, of land, land holdings? And, and do the arm's length organizations from the Scottish government, are they come, do they come under the, the same policies as the Scottish government? And what Derek said at the time was, yeah, the Scottish government holds the land in trust for the Scottish people. So I'm just wondering if you, if I know you're not the Scottish government, that's in your SLC, but there is kind of key components of what the work that you're doing in terms of public land and what's coming, coming up with natural capital so my question is, does the Scottish government hold the land in trust for the Scottish people? Right. OK, so it sounds to me as if the Scottish government have answered it, that question for you through Derek. So I, I can't answer it. I'm not, not the Scottish government. And I'm not sure whether you mean it in a legal sense or a conceptual sense. Conceptually, it's pretty undeniable they hold it for the Scottish people. Uh, legally, it's probably more complicated. Um, I, what I will do when I come back to Hamish and David, though, is, is ask them to say a bit about the whole business of public ownership of land, which is, you know, 
land reform is, is as much about public owners of land and NGO, NGO owners of land as it is about private owners. I think it's very important to be clear about that. Right. Um, Alison, I, I know you've had one bite, but let's have another go. You're over to you. Go on then. I'll have another week go. I'm really <laughs> following on from Alistair. My, it's a bit of a naive question, but given that there are so many thousands of acres of Scottish land that can't be traced to any owner, because so many of them seem to be offshore accounts and businesses hiding businesses. Nobody knows who owns them. I remember finding this out a few years ago when there was um, another consultation. And I just wondered, is there any legal way of actually claiming that land for Scotland, for the people of Scotland? If people aren't willing to come forward and say, yes, it's my land, well, why can't we just take it from them? Great, thanks, Alison. I'll, I, I'm going to answer that very quickly to just to short circuit things before coming on. Uh, um, so if, if it definitely hasn't got an owner, there is a way of doing it. And there's a group in Inverness just has just done that. A community group has just done that, gone through that process. And it's written up as a case study. And if Posey can find it, they, I think we have it on our website. So we'll put a link up. But, but if not, um, if, you, if you email us, we'll try and find it for you. Um, that's brilliant that's a dangerous idea we need to pursue quickly Yay. Can be done. there is a lot of land the, the, the whole business of completing and updating the scottish land register is still in progress so that's that's a much wider issue and a much bigger issue but it but it is broadly on track it is a huge task it's an expensive task and public money is not in plentiful supply but i think the current aim is but hamish will correct me is to try and get the register fully up to date by the 2026 I think is the current target um let's come on to to um sorry I've forgotten what you said the p was for so pj lewis forgive me over to you <laughs> must be muted sorry you you disappeared for a second was that for me yes please yeah thank you sorry I, I I just wanted quickly to respond to David Adams point about quantitative or qualitative evidence rather than quantitative and um, as a piece of qualitative evidence I see no quantitative evidence and secondly if you're going to pursue the police line you must understand that qualitative evidence is dismissed as hearsay it's not fact it has its place I accept particularly to reinforce and add color to quantitative evidence but but i just don't see any quantitative evidence at all i'm afraid thank you for the chance to reply thanks very much indeed no understood absolutely understood i love these arguments between academics it gets very exciting but um i i, I think there is genuinely i i suspect that you're sort of almost in a funny kind of way violently disagreeing but missing in the middle <laughs> um but sorry violently agreeing but but but, but but missing. I don't think David would disagree that, that you know there is quant qualitative and there is quantitative. Um, you can come back in a second, David, if you want. But I want to, Alistair's wanting back in. Alistair, please come back in. You're muted. Alistair. Sorry, that was a, that was a mistake. Sorry about that. Oh, oh, that was a hand left up. Right. Okay. Good. So um, that there's no hands up for for the time being. So um, and there's one or two things in the chat as well. Forgive me if I got distracted and missed them as they shot up and down this blooming screen but um Hamish, i mean pick up anything you like um but 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 in particular i think you know again quite a lot of stuff about about um how do we engage everybody in land use decision making uh, and indeed land reform decision making how do we how do we make sure we don't miss out on on gamekeepers or, or or whoever that that was just an example that was given that that this point about inclusion is is massively important there are huge chunks of scottish society that are just excluded from this and you, you might want to pick up the young people point because they are to some extent excluded although we're trying really hard a lot of urban scotland is excluded completely from the land reform debate um, so some very, a number of points, Hamish, and, and just give you free reign. Go for it. Yeah, a couple, couple of thoughts on on the engagement side. I mean, it's 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 hugely important for us, obviously, as as a land commission, as a public body, for ourselves to try and reach um, a really wide range of voices and hear from a wide range of voices. But but I think it's also equally important in the in what we're doing and the work that we're doing and how we 
you know, how actually in the wider land sector uh, those voices are brought into decisions about land, not just by us as a, as a public body, but by landowners, by land managers uh, and decision makers, you know, right across what we're talking about here. So, so it is really challenging, absolutely. Um, there's, um, you know, there's, there's lots of good experience on this in Scotland now. There are people that do this really well, and there's some really good examples right across urban uh, and rural Scotland um, increasingly, I think. You'll find some case studies on our website and elsewhere. So I'm, I'm kind of optimistic about engagement because people are on the case and, and there is an awful lot happening. Um, just a couple of, couple of examples, and, and we're, we're certainly focusing very much on, uh, on, on youth and young engagement. Uh, recently, we hosted uh, a short internship uh, where we actually thought direct, uh, direct work from uh, a young person rather younger than uh, much of the team. Um, to actually advise us on how to, to go about this. And, and we're, we're midway through actually putting that kind of process together to make sure that we as a commission have ways of directly bringing in the voice of young people into our work. Uh, and no doubt we'll learn from that as to what might work for others in the land sector as well. Um, I think uh, the, the wider point, if I can link it to, that was raised about accountability uh, and engagement, um, and particularly in relation to, to biodiversity and nature. Um, Again, you know, one, one way into that is simply through good engagement uh, with local communities and, and spotting the mutual opportunities. And again, we can see lots of good examples of that happening uh, between communities, land managers, uh, nature conservation organizations. Uh, in terms of strengthening some of that, you know, one, one of the proposals um, in the, the consultations land reform bill at the moment is that there should be a, an obligation to prepare management plans uh, for large land holdings. And again, that would provide a real opportunity. And indeed, that was one of the, one of the recommendations we made that there should be an opportunity uh, to have a clear sense of, of what a land holding is setting out to do, how that how you can achieve the, the win-wins with uh, community objectives as well in that area um, and where the mutual opportunities might be. So I think there are a number of things kind of in train that will help strengthen some of these um, relationships, um, but, but no doubt it is challenging to reach all those groups. I, I wondered, Andrew, if I could also just pick up on the, the public land ownership um, point that was raised. Um, and ju just briefly, I think two, two points I would want to, to reflect on that. The first is that, um, you know, the, the expectations of land reform and the land rights responsibilities apply to public landowners as much as they do to private landowners or indeed community landowners or nature conservation um, bodies. So, so in that sense, you know, land reform very much is just as much about public land ownership. And we work directly with some of the big public landowners um, in terms of looking at culture change and practice as well, uh, in terms of what they're doing. Um, and, and again, the, in terms of the, the, land, the current natural capital focus, land market and carbon, uh, one of our recent recommendations was that public landowners could be more active uh, in the way that they develop new governance models, shared models of, of sharing governance and control with communities, for example. Um, perhaps more joint ventures, uh, bringing private and community and, and, and public bodies together uh, in land ownership uh, models. Uh, so we, we see a really active role for public bodies as very active stewards of land on behalf of people in Scotland. Um, and I think you know, increasingly, um, particularly with, with new investment and, uh, and, the, and the land use change that we're seeing at the moment, uh, there's a bigger opportunity to pursue that now than, than ever, I think. Thanks. Um, David, just before I come to you, Barbara's asking, do we dare interact directly with Borders Schools and Borders College? Off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that. We may do. We are, I do emphasise, we're a tiny wee organisation. We've got 14 people for the whole of Scotland providing advice to government and everybody else. Um, so we may not, and if we don't, please forgive us, but if, 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 you're, if you are involved with them, Barbara, please you know, and, and you've got questions or they've got questions, you know, for goodness sake, please contact us. We'll do our best to help. Um, you know, if we're not in touch with them, it's not because we don't want to be. It's just because for some reason it hasn't happened. Um, great. Uh, David, I, before I, I've got Christopher waiting, but um, um, thoughts on, on, on at the stage of, of the evening on the things you've been hearing? I'm not going to pin you to any particular points. You're muted, David. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I, I think Hamish is, is correct in terms of the responsibility on, on public bodies owning land. And um, certainly we've been very clear in stressing that uh, responsibilities lie with the, the public sector as much with the, the private sector. I mean, I, I, I think um, the purpose of owning, I mean, conceptually, obviously, public bodies do own land for the benefit and in trust for whoever 
uh, that they are accountable to. Um, legally, I, 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 not so, because actually um, the registration does actually specify the purpose. Um, if, if you wanted to find a purpose, then if land is acquired under the Highway Act, the purpose is to provide a road, and it's as sort of as legal as that. Um, can, I, can I just come back at because some very, very interesting discussions made, and, and, and the point was made that the, uh, the factor might well feel intimidated himself at the, the meeting, and that could well have been the case. I, I think what I was trying to say is, let's not discount stories. Let's not, that they are an important part of evidence. What you then have got to do, obviously, is try and find where the balance of stories or weight of stories lies. I mean, you don't just go for one individual story and say that's the overall case. But if you have over a, a large area similar stories coming from similar bodies, um, that may be pointing in a particular direction. So all I wanted to say is evidence is far wider than statistics. And we shouldn't simply be looking for statistical evidence in order um, to substantiate reform proposals coming forward. There are, there are all types of evidence and they need to be carefully weighed and understood, but we need to listen to people's stories and actually go out of a way, as has been said, to try and find out stories from people who may be reluctant to uh, come to a meeting such as this and, and, and give their stories. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, David. In a funny sort of way, Helen made the same point when she said we should be out there talking to people on the hills. That's, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's the same point, and I couldn't agree more. I learned so much uh, about, well, all my work, but, but this work in particular, from getting off my backside and going wandering about the place. But I, I have to admit, I'm not counting things very often. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just listening. Right. Um, we've got 20 odd minutes left. Christopher, uh, you've been sitting very patiently with your hand up. So over to you. Thank you. Um, I belong to a local community council in Tweedale West, and there have been several cases over the last few years of large scale plantations uh, coming in, or sort of starting anyway. And uh, there's really three points uh, that I had in my mind. Uh, one is the, um, the notice to local people that this plantation is going to happen and exactly where it's going to be. Uh, are you satisfied that the um, information distribution on that is sufficient? Uh, my second question is, um, would it make sense for you to do a land use uh, report in general terms about big new plantations uh, and saying, for example, what you thought the principles should be on walks within the plantation, uh, about access to archaeological sites, about the mix of broadleaf and uh, conifer, for example. Um, so there's a general report there. And then thirdly, uh, would it or would it not make sense for uh, these new plantations to be subject to the same planning rules as applies to uh, big new housing estates? Christopher, thanks. I'm very anxious that this is about your views as much as ours. What are your views on those points? Right. My view is that there is definitely not adequate information becoming available to local people in time. Um, and uh, uh, at, at one stage, one of our local councillors said that she was going to put in place a new system for notifications which came to the Scottish Borders Council to be farmed out locally. I'm not aware that that's happened. Um, secondly, report on best practice. I think it would be extremely valuable if an organisation such as yours, which is concerned with land use, were to do a report of this kind, not binding because every site is different, but setting out what is in general terms uh, best practice. I think that would be very helpful. And on the planning permission point, uh, I think that uh, probably there is a case for it. There may be a case against it in terms of uh, the local councillors not having enough knowledge, perhaps, of the, uh, the the trees aspect of it. So uh, I, th I think it's personally, I think it needs to be looked at carefully to see whether that would make sense or not, to give it so that local people could then have the same kind of say as they might have in relation to a housing estate. 
Thanks, Christopher. Yeah, that's very, that is very thoughtful. Um, you may well want to pick that up, Hamish. I will give Hamish and David one more chance before half past eight, but I do want to hear from others, so I'm going to do that. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Though that's um, yeah, pretty interesting actually. Uh, Beth's next. Beth, over to you. Thank you. Um, yesterday, I, I was at a meeting um, for the the New Borders uh, Community Climate Action Network, um, which is part of um, a, a nationwide um, uh, a network um, called SCAN, the Scottish Community Climate Action Network, um, which you're probably aware of. But it just occurred to me that um, you know several of the issues raised today were raised at that meeting yesterday, and that would be a forum on which, um, you know, you could, um, with your, you know, small team, um, sort of uh, strategically use your time to hear very relevant points of view. And I'm just wondering to what extent you're collaborating with, with SCAM um, nationwide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Beth. Um, I mean, we, are, we are doing our level best to, to collaborate with all sorts of folk. Um, I, I'm not, I don't actually know the specific answer. Hamish may want to pick it up in due course, but I want there's two people still waiting who haven't spoken, so I want to hear from them at the very least. Jenny, over to you. I'm from a community council as well, and we have a particular problem with one um, proposed plantation that is just outside our area, but is going to affect us a lot. And the one thing we're aware of is that there doesn't seem to be any way of putting in an objection. Gosh, right. Well, I, I think there is. So I'm going to, when, when I come back to you, Hamish, I'm going to just ask you to say a bit about how that system works, if you wouldn't mind, because I think I think there is, in, unless it's not getting any public money, and I can't believe that, but almost all of them are, there is a system. I'll come back to that, Jenny. Thanks for raising that. Tess, over to you. Sorry. Hi, I'm just um, interested, um, which body is actually overseeing and therefore in charge of the whole of the sort of reforesting of Scotland. Uh, so that will be a, well, there's, yeah, so for, there's Forest and Land Scotland and there's Forestry Scotland, both public bodies. And I'll get Hamish to pick up, up on that uh, rather than attempt to, to summarize it myself. Um, uh, yeah, I could, but I think I, I, I'll get Hamish to pick that up in a second, Tess, thanks. Um, Anne, I see you want back in, so I'll let Anne back in again, and then I'm going to come to you, Hamish, I think, unless another hand goes up. I think you're muted, Anne. Thanks, Andrew. I'm still not knowing how we best go about defining what is the public interest. It doesn't seem to me there's a single universal model because if you take, and I've done a very bad drawing, it looks a bit like a darts board gone wrong. If you take village X, it may have a kind of physical dimension of two kilometers. However, local, unless you're truly parochial, is 20 kilometers. For some people, their nearest town may be 50 kilometers. Then is the interest one of those, or is it Scotland wide, or is it international? So do you do it? I mean, what is the metrics for doing it? By geography, thematically, by the corporate interest, by the biodiversity interest, by the money grubber interest, by the natural capital interest. I keep asking myself, and there will be people here like you and David and Hamish who will have a much better idea. How do we reach a consistent approach to what, in, and I know you're gonna say you can't answer for the government because of consultation, but it seems to me there is a real difficulty in defining the public interest because it may be so variable across parts of Scotland. So, um, I mean, yes, it is a consultation, and, and, and I think, you know, I'm very glad you're thinking about it. But it's a conundrum. It's a, it's a, it seems to me an awful conundrum somehow. Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, let's just take a different example. So a planning application is determined according to what people believe is in the public interest. 
And normally, if it's if it's the colour of your door, um, that decision is taken quite locally, um, uh, and it's taken at different levels, and it's taken on a case by case basis. And this notion of defining the public interest seems to me to be a, a fundamentally flawed idea. You don't def because the public interest in any given case is is entirely related to that case. Uh, you know, a planning authority will determine the public interest in a housing estate, but it will do so according to national, or, or at least in cognizance with national planning policy put in place by Scottish government, so it's clearly a much bigger picture. There are times when um, developments are so significant that the public interest is determined at a national level. So, for example, any significant wind farm will probably be determined at a national level. Um, I, I think that's a you know that that, that that I hope is a reasonably helpful analogy. But but at the end of the day, a consultation is a consultation, and I'm not sure that me telling you what you should say in response to a consultation is particularly <laughs> particularly wise or or, or reasonable. Actually, <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't asking in that sense. But I do think it's quite a difficult question because it will be so variable. So when the consult when the consultation is framed, sorry when when the consultation was drafted do you think the government actually thought that people would come up with a single answer because that seems to me an impossible answer because it doesn't work like can't work like that well i'm quite certain that, that in going to consultation what the government is looking for is a range of ideas um so there's no one idea um but let me give you an idea let, let me suggest to you uh and, and, and please don't take this as me telling you what you should put in the consultation. But just... No, don't worry, I won't, Andrew, don't worry. <laughs> but, but it seems to me quite reasonable that if a piece of land that is, let's for the sake of argument, a large land holding of five or 10,000 hectares is to change hands, that, that the a body, and it could be a probably a, a democratically elected body, should consider whether it is in the public interest for that piece of land to change hands in its entirety as one holding, or whether there should be conditions put on that transfer, or whether in fact there should be a requirement that it's sold in three or four lots or whatever, or that part of it is put into crofting tenure or whatever else. There needs to be a body to determine that in accordance to what, with what it considers to be the public interest. And let me also suggest to you that what might be the public interest in Northwest Sutherland might not be considered to be the public mm -hmm. interest in borders. Um, because that's how democracy works. <laughs> People have different views. So, but I, I, I'm in danger of getting sucked into trying to tell you what to put in the consultation. So I'm going to close that one. But when you come back saying a democratically uh, elected body involved in the public interest test, um, that's at variance with what actually was said at Langham when it was suggested that it would come to your commission. Well, I, I, by the by, the cabinet secretary, or by, by either Lorna Slater or um, Mary McCallum. But I wasn't there, so I don't know what was said. No. But it was a consultation. People are being asked for their opinions. If you don't think that this body should be democratically accountable, then say so. If you do, you, so you said democratically elected. That's why I picked you up, Andrew. Well, okay, elected or accountable, or I mean, well, it's very I, different. I, I'm appointed through through a competitive yeah. interview process. I'm not elected. I'm going to close that subject, if you don't mind, the, the subject of a consultation. And I'm going to come to Hamish. Well, let me just check first, because we've only got nine minutes left. Anybody else wish to speak? Please press your hand button, or whatever it's called. No? OK. Right, Hamish, let, let's take the chance, and we've got nine minutes or so. Hamish and David, let's just take the chance to pause and reflect. There's a lot of things been said, um, a lot of food for thought. It's pretty clear that there are a particular set of priorities, I was going to say in the borders, but that would be a mistake because you know, it's a self-selecting audience. But certainly in this audience, there's a set of priorities which are different from the, the priorities you'll hear in other parts of Scotland. That's why we do these things on a regional basis. There are other things that have not been discussed. Poor David was looking forward to telling you all about housing and land reform and another chance, um, which surprises me actually, because housing is usually an issue in rural Scotland. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to invite you, Hamish, and then David, to just reflect on what you've heard and also to chuck in anything you think you ought to offer in terms of what we think 
we might be working on over the next few while that hasn't been raised if you want as well. Hamish first. Thanks, Andrew. I'll, um, I'll just pick up uh, the, go back to the points that were raised about forestry, actually, just to, to try and uh, address some of the, the questions that were raised. So a very, very, very simple point first. Uh, I think the question was asked about who kind of oversees the, the woodland expansion, forestry expansion targets in Scotland. Um, and, that, and that is um, Scottish Forestry, uh, who are an arm of government, uh, the Government Forestry Agency. So it's, it's their role to kind of oversee the, the national woodland uh, expansion targets. Uh, and they, of course, manage the, the grant uh, funding associated with uh, woodland planting. Um, forestry and Land Scotland, of course, are the, are the public landowner um, that actually own uh, forest and other land. Um, but it's Scottish Forestry that oversee that sort of woodland expansion and woodland policy um, side of things. And, and then just sort of connected to that, I think the question was asked about um, forestry consultations. Um, uh, there, there certainly is, uh, certainly if a, if a forestry scheme is, is applying for grant funding, uh, there certainly is an obligation to consult and there is a public register of uh, applications um, and there are very well established ways for communities to engage in that process, the forestry um, planning consultation process. Um, I would say we're we're working directly with Scottish Forestry at the moment um, on looking at uh, how they strengthen community engagement uh, in terms of wooden expansion, precisely because it is a, a hugely topical issue and, and you know one of the biggest challenges in terms of managing land use change um, across Scotland. Uh, so they they have already given a commitment in their new um, kind of forestry plan to to strengthen the way that communities are engaged in decision making and indeed in looking at benefits that flow from forestry um, expansion and investment. So we are at the moment, and we will, I think, increasingly be working directly with uh, Scottish Forestry and others, uh, looking at how we apply some of these ideas that we've been talking about, community engagement, community benefit uh, in the, the forest sector um, specifically. Then I think finally, Andrew, the, the only other aspect that I would uh, flag and come back to, we've touched on it a wee bit, but I, a lot of what we've talked about is about managing change um, and, and the land use change and the kind of joined up um, planning that's needed to do that well. Um, and, I, and I would flag, we've mentioned them briefly, but the, the idea of uh, regional land use partnerships uh, and, a, and a regional land use framework, uh, you, I think in, in, in the south of Scotland, you are lucky in the sense that um, the Scottish government is piloting um, what is called uh, regional land use uh, partnerships, which is an idea to bring more coordination to the kind of land use change and better engagement and a wider range of voices planning that land use change. We provided advice originally a couple of years ago to government on, on how we thought this process could work. And they've now set up these five pilots, including, of course, one in the south of Scotland. Uh, and, and I think there's huge potential there. And I really would encourage people to engage with that process in the south of Scotland and see how you can make that work for, for your area. Um, huge challenges, of course, in that, but it but absolutely can't, can't be wrong to find ways of providing better joined up decision making and then getting a wider range of voices into that process. David, thanks very much. David, um, last thoughts from you on anything you like. Well, I think we've just demonstrated tonight how broad the land reform agenda is, and we haven't even got on to maybe desert land or housing or other things that we might have discussed, like common good land, of which um, that there is quite a lot of controversy and, and, and examples in, in Scotland and in, in the borders area where uh, it perhaps has not worked as, as well as it might. So uh, I, I, th I think the point you've made about uh, the, the, the way the Commission operates, that um, one of the hardest things as Commissioners, the Commissioners are just sort of part-time board members, but are, 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 are here to try and give some kind of strategic direction. So that's why it's the Commissioners who are here at the public meetings rather than necessarily staff. But one of the hardest things we have is making the choices of how to target uh, what is a fairly limited amount of of resource. So I think all I would say is that if you if you think we're not doing enough, then maybe um, say to your MSPs um, that really the Commission needs to do more. And, and, and obviously there's budgetary implications to that, that uh, we could do more. But I think actually, in fairness, if you look at our website, the Commission has done a huge amount of stuff in a relatively short space of time. And more importantly, probably stimulated quite a lot of debate and discussion that is leading up to the Land Reform Bill. But I should also say, uh, we hope we'll find the way into another bill, which is the Community Wealth Building Bill that will be coming to 
Parliament in due course. So just thank everyone for their contributions tonight, Andrew. David, thank you. Um, yes, as, a, as someone who read uh, Small is Beautiful when I was younger, I'm very happy that we don't want to get too much too big, actually. Um, we're, we're, we're trying hard. Alison, I did see that your hand shot up. I, it'll have to be brief, sorry, because I'm going to close it. To, at it, is very, it is very brief. It's just to say there is a big housing issue. I live in East Berwickshire on the coast. It's full of second homeowners. It's full of Airbnbs, young families, young people don't have access to social or you know cheap housing and and also obviously the issue of employment for young people as well so uh, yeah thanks, just to say there is there is an issue it's a, a big issue thanks i i didn't it was tongue in cheek i didn't for one moment think there isn't a housing issue in borders actually i'm i'm painfully aware of it because uh, every time i'm down the borders i hear about it a great i mean obviously uh, uh, so Time's run out, so I, I, I will wrap things up. Um, I, I have a feeling we could um, hold another of these meetings in another hour and a half or two hours, because there's obviously a lot of issues uh, bubbling around. Um, so, and we will, because we, we will hold these meetings every month around the country. We will be back, and we will either be back online or be back physically in the borders before long. And the board also gets itself around the country one way or the other. So. Um, you know, we'll continue to, we, we're constantly continuing to try and understand the context that we work in, the priorities of the people that we serve, and then we figure out how to do that. Um, we have a website. I, I, I would ask you to, to use it. There's just a vast amount of really interesting stuff there, actually. Um, it's just, I want, Posey, if you can hear me, I wonder if you could put the website address up, please, in the chat. It's Land Commission. Of Scotland. Um, but please, if I mean, if in doubt, just Google Scottish Land Commission, you'll find it. Um, or your favourite, whatever the, the thing, engine thing. Um, the, the other thing I would ask you is in a, in, a, in a normal public meeting, or what I, old people like me, think of as a normal public meeting, we now close the meeting and then people come and tell me the things that they didn't dare tell me in public, um, but they still want to tell me. Um, for that reason, I am anxious that you feel that you can contact me if you wish. So there is an email address. And again, Posey's put the website up. Thanks, Posey. Posey, could you put the email address up too, please? It's info at Land Commission, Gov Scott. Um, I am anxious that you feel free to contact uh, me in private. So email me, give me a phone number, and, and, and I'll give you a ring and we'll have a chat. Um, and it's just the same as nobbling me after a meeting in a corner. I will not uh, divulge anything that you tell me in confidence, but I think it's important that you have that, that opportunity. Uh, uh, it's part of me being accountable. Um, I think that's probably pretty much it, really. Uh, I do want to say thank you very much to David and Hamish. Um, uh, always difficult to react in the hoof. You never know what people are going to want to talk about. I think they've done so very well. Huge thanks to Posey, who's been popping things up in the chat all the time and keeping everything organised. But, but more than anything, just a huge thank to all of, all of you. And it's really, these public meetings work for us. We do learn a heck of a lot. And they work because so many people come and they're willing to engage and stick their hand up and stick their neck out. So thanks very, very much. Really much appreciated. I do hope you have a safe journey to your kitchen or, or wherever you're off to a booze cupboard or something. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again sometime. Thank you. Good night.